Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our online uh, version of Victoria's third environmental science series event of 2021. Today's talk will be focusing on the effects of pharmaceuticals in aquatic environments, bridging the gap between lab and field. My name is Professor Mark Taylor. I'm Victoria's chief environmental scientist at, Envi at the Environment Protection Authority in Victoria. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Aboriginal people as the first peoples and traditional custodians of the land and water on which we live, work and depend. I am speaking to you today from the Dorig country in Sydney, Australia. We respect, we pay respect to Aboriginal elders past and present. As Victoria's environmental regulator, we pay, pay respect to how country has been protected and cared for by Aboriginal people over many tens of thousands of years. We recognise the unique cultural and spiritual significance of land, water, and all that is in the environment and the continuing connection and aspirations for a country of Aboriginal people and, tra and traditional custodians. So just a few notes uh, to this, uh, with respect to this live stream event. Please be patient with respect to any technical dif difficulties. The structure of today's event will feature on an introduction by myself, followed by most importantly, presentations by guest speakers, and there'll be some time for questions and answers and, and a brief conclusion. The event is recorded. So uh, if you need to leave early or if you miss any parts of this session, you can watch it later uh, via uh, EPA's website. The session has live closed captions to enable it being accessible for all. And we will open the question and answer a session now, but we'll respond to the questions after the presentations. Please provide your questions at the icon uh, with the question mark on your screen. We will try to get as many questions in as possible and try to get them answered today. And if not, they will be responded to later via email. Please provide your contact details so we can respond directly to you. So to, to, to today's conference, we're here to talk about pharmaceuticals and their effects on aquatic environments and the work underway to bridge knowledge gaps between field and environment and laboratory studies. For the purpose of our discussion, pharmaceuticals can be defined as any product used for personal health, cosmetic reasons, or used by agribusiness to enhance growth and health. Without doubt, pharmaceuticals have undeniable benefits. They have enhanced food production, but there are difficulties in addressing their potential impacts to our environment and human health. Pharmaceuticals are in, considered to be an emerging contaminant of concern. This means, there are a variety of synthetic pharmaceuticals in the environment. There is limited or absent information or full information about their concentrations in the environment, sources, spatial distribution, and fate. The risk they pose to our health and the environment is not fully understood. Therefore, information about the toxicity and risks associated, associated with pharmaceuticals in the environment and our consumption of them inadvertently is important. With the growing and aging human population, pharmaceut pharmaceutical use has increased globally. This means we have a greater number of pharmaceuticals passing through our bodies, wastewater systems, and into the environment. Global research has shown that pharmaceuticals are found in surface and groundwaters that are used in irrigation as well as drinking water. Previous studies today have shown that pharmaceuticals can disrupt sensory capabilities of animals and their ability to locate food and mates. In addition, exposure to pharmaceuticals can alter the ability of animals to capture prey or escape predators. One of our guest speakers today will be elaborating further on the, these effects. Pharmaceutical pollution challenges traditional water quality management because it requires new technologies, wastewater treatment and different behaviors in industry, agriculture and health sectors along with society in order to address the problem. Further work is needed to better understand background concentrations of pharmaceuticals in the environment and the risk that they pose to human health and the environment. The role of the EPA is to protect the environment and human health from risks of harm associated with pollution and waste. The EPA has started examining baseline data for a number of emerging contaminants in Victoria, as we will hear today. Our work supports, uh, is supporting uh, this particular area of key research involving the following items. What are the effects on our environment and on humans? What risks do they pose and how can we minimize those risks? 
EPA continues to work with other regulators, research partners and industry, both in, in Australia and internationally, to build knowledge and understanding of pharmaceuticals. So today, in discussing this important topic and effects on the environment and public health, it helps us to build our knowledge and understanding of the problem. On that note, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our two guest speakers for today, Dr. Minas Aristo and Professor Thomas Brodin. Dr. Minas Aristo is a senior applied scientist and a leader, in the, and a leader of the Emerging Contaminants Program at EPA. Minna has led projects assessing background concentrations of emerging contaminants in Victoria, exploring effects of wastewater treatment plant effluents on wildlife and unraveling the presence of emerging contaminants in recycled water. Minna's expertise is in behavioral ecotoxicology and she has over 16 years of international and national experience on assessing the impact of chemical contaminants on wildlife. Also, I am absolutely delighted to, be, uh, to have our international guest speaker, Professor Thomas Brodin from Sweden, and who, who works at the University of Agricultural Sciences to talk to us about his research in this space. During the last decade, Thomas has focused on studying the ecological effects of pharmaceuticals in aquatic systems. He has a background in evolution and behavioral ecology, and he's now using this knowledge to increase the ecological relevance of chemical risk assessment in general, but also specifically related to pharmaceuticals. His research bridges the gap between lab and the real world by combining his laboratory experiments for a mechanistic understanding with respect to large scale field studies that help answer the big question, what happens in the lake and stream when pharmaceuticals are released into those environments? So today, I look forward to listening to you both. And thank you for both of you for joining us today and preparing your talks, which I know how much that takes and how much effort you'll have gone over your top talks and slides multiple times. I will now hand over to Minna, who will provide an overview of the EPA's Emerging, Emerging Contaminants Program. Thank you very much, Minna. Thank you, Mark. And hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many of you out there today. And I'm very excited to be here today and talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about. And some of you in the audience might know that I've researched pharmaceuticals for, I would say, the 16 years that I've been in, in this space. And today I'll be sharing the work that I've done uh, here at the EPA Victoria. But before I move into pharmaceuticals, I take a few minutes to talk about the Emerging Contaminants program that we have at the EPA Victoria, which some of you might not be aware of. And the program aims to monitor and assess environmental quality of water, land and air in a context of emerging contaminants. And it aims to identify and assess environmental human health risks associated with these contaminants. But most importantly, it's there to guide duty holders to reduce the risk and prevent harm to human health and environment, and also to increase EPS understanding of emerging contaminants so that we can develop better environmental standards and guidance for management. But we're here to talk about pharmaceuticals, and I'm sure we all agree that it is a growing global problem. But let's put some numbers on a problem. So the global pharmaceutical market uh, has been estimated to exceed US uh, $1.5 trillion by 2023, which is actually an annual growth rate, growth rate of 6% over the next five years. But bringing the numbers back to Australia, uh, in 2017-18, there were more than 300 million prescriptions dispensed uh, only in Australia alone, and this is an, an increase of 1.5%. And if you look at the, um, the drugs listed on the left, those are the 10 most prescribed drugs in Australia. And one of them here uh, there in the middle is cephalexine, which is an antibiotic, and I'll be talking about it uh, more later today. But it's important to be aware of where actually are these pharmaceuticals coming from. And it's easy that we think about only the human pharmaceuticals, but they're also coming from veterinary uh, practices, such as aquaculture, companion animals and livestock. And all the human pharmaceutical resources and uh, veterinary pharmaceuticals, all these then together end up in the freshwater environments, all the way to the groundwater and even in the terrestrial ecosystems. And therefore, uh, it's not surprising that more than 4,000 active pharmaceutical ingredients have been detected in the environment. But what makes this pharmaceutical pollution especially emerging concern is that these chemicals actually have been designed to be really highly active and really interact with the receptors in humans and in and animals. And because we're using them all the time, they actually continuously release to the environment, which means that the non-target organisms are exposed to these for a very long period of time. 
And one um, element that is very specific for pharmaceuticals is that they actually have something called non-monotonic dose response, that the response may be greater at the lower dose than at the high dose. And this means that the low concentrations really matter. But let me walk you through a work that I was lucky to uh, lead here at EPA Victoria. And this work was, we did the sampling last year in March, 2020. And the aim of the study was to pretty much start with the basics. So let's establish background concentrations of pharmaceuticals and personal care products, that's the PPCP, and endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs, uh, what are the concentrations in fresh water and in biota across different sites in Victoria. And we wanted to investigate, is there a difference between the upstream and downstream sites and is there also association to the discharge points? Well, let's look at those um, sites a bit more closely. So here on the right, you see a map of the sampling sites. Overall, we are covered 18 different sites. There's uh, two along the blue side reference sites. So we have three reference sites, two along the Lodurk River, one along the Watts River, and then we sampled Barbie Creek, Canvas Blue River, Jackson's Creek, Mary Creek, and Mala Mullen Creek. And we had a three sites per location design. So we had um, the yellow here is a um, upstream, and then there's a hotspot and downstream. And the upstream site was approximately two kilometers from the hotspot, and the downstream site was approximately another two kilometers uh, from the discharge point. And the discharge point is not an effluent. We didn't collect the effluent, we collected what's actually in the, um, in the waterway, so in a creek or river. So it's an environmental sample. And from each side, we collected both fish and water. So approximately aimed to have 18 fish per site, but the guys actually were very uh, successful with catching fish. So I would say we have more than 20 individuals from each side. So overall, we're talking about sample size of more than 300 fish um, that we were able to analyze through this uh, sampling campaign. And for water um, analysis, we used uh, two methods. So we used a spot sampling and then passive sampling. So here on the uh, bottom left, you see this um, a canister uh, that has inside uh, little filters, discs that have filters, and those filters were uh, deployed for 28 days. So you will see in my talk today, I talk about day zero and day 28. So the day zero is when uh, passive samplers were deployed and day 28 was when they were retreated. So we have three data points from each, each site. And both fish and water were analyzed for pharmaceuticals, personal care products, uh, EDCs, and also for PFAS. But today we were focusing on the pharmaceutical and EDC results. So what did we find? So here is um, pharmaceuticals in water uh, data based on the collection uh, from the day 28. And on the y-axis there, uh, it's a total pharmaceuticals from zero to 10 in microns per liter. And on the x-axis, we have the different sampling sites. So from left to right, first are the reference sites, then we have Barnaby Creek, Campus B, Jackson's, Mala Malam and Mary. And we have these uh, three uh, sites per location design here. So there's upstream, discharge and downstream. And um, I've listed here on the right, the top 10 pharmaceuticals that were detected at the uh, most frequently. And starting from the, I, I, I doubt that probably not everyone in the audience know what these are, so I'm gonna just quickly go through them. So venlafaxine is an antidepressant, uh, paracetamol is a painkiller, uh, oxazepam is a medication used to treat anxiety disorders, uh, methamphetamine is a recreational drug, uh, gabapentin is a medication used to treat parcel seizures, uh, furosemide is a medication used to treat high blood pressure. Uh, diclofenac um, is an anti-inflammatory drug. Cephalexine is an antibiotic. Uh, Carbamisabine, medication used to treat epilepsy and neurobatic pain. And astrophim K is an artificial sweetener. So a selection of uh, painkillers, antidepressants, and um, um, I would say high blood pressure um, medication. And these 10 are actually quite standard, what has been happily detected elsewhere in the world as well. But then let's look at more closely the differences because that was one of the key that we wanted to see differences between locations as well. And it's not surprising that the discharge point has the highest concentrations. And if you look at the Pyramid Creek, the discharge point has up to 10 microns per liter total pharmaceutical load compared to Jackson's Creek, which has um, up to 2.83 microns per liter. But what is interesting is that people often think that when the pharmaceuticals in, end up in environment, they get diluted and you hardly see anything in the downstream. But if you look at the Barnaby Creek site, downstream, which was 2.4 kilometers from the discharge, we still get um, three microns per liter of concentrations. And what other differences are between these locations are things like they have different treatment levels. So at the Barnaby Creek SDP, um, they use secondary treatment, while in the Mary Creek, there's a, um, they use a tertiary treatment. So that's obvious 
difference that makes difference for pharmaceuticals. The other thing is like what kind of waste they're receiving. So Byron Beach Creek side, they are receiving both a domestic and industrial waste, but also they actually at the Byron Beach Creek side, they actually are uh, the mead, uh, mead flow per day is um, more than 8,000 kiloliters per day, while in Mary Creek is around 2,600. So then the uh, flow and the waste and the treatment all makes a difference when we look at then what are then the pharmaceuticals coming out of the other end. But let's uh, have a look at then what, what do we find in terms of different um, collection methods. So I said that we use two different uh, methods for water. So we use spot sampling and, and passive samplers. And here on the y-axis we have a uh, mean concentration uh, of uh, pharmaceuticals uh, in nanograms per liter from 0 to 1200. And on the x-axis we have all the different pharmaceuticals. So we analyzed 72 different uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. And what we found was that um, out of the 72, with the passive sampler, we were able to detect 59, while with the spot, sam spot sampling method, we collected uh, 39. And again, it makes, makes uh, it seems pretty obvious that when you have a filter that filters the water for a longer period of time, you would get more, but it's good to uh, show them evidence that yes, that was the case uh, in this study. But also what is um, important to note that these two different methods actually then um, show slightly different results. If we look at then what were the top three chemicals that were coming out uh, as, as being the top chemicals of concern. So with the passive sampler, uh, POCUS, uh, the venlafaxine was the one that was detected at the highest concentrations. Then, uh, then came uh, carbamazepine, tramadol and oxazepam. Uh, with the spot uh, water samples, it was actually cephalexine that was the highest. And then came uh, furosemide, um, hydrochlorothiazide, uh, which is a um, high blood pressure medication, and then venlafaxine. So venlafaxine came out in both of them, but then the, um, the cephalexine antibiotic was clearly uh, detected more commonly in the spot samples. So again, the take home message is that it's important to use multiple different methods when you're monitoring for pharmaceuticals in water. But moving on to what did we find in terms of pharmaceuticals in biota? And as I mentioned, we did um, have samples of more than 300 fish, but because um, the, here's a summary, due to the time constraints, I'm only gonna show the data for the fish that we measured, we're able to measure the edible portion. So these fish are all uh, big enough that we were, because for the um, analysis, you need a certain volume. So if the fish is very small, you, you have to uh, analyze the whole fish. So um, this is summary of data for blackfish, carp, eel, redfin, road tens, and then there's a crustacean yabby there as well that we call from the reference side. And we analyzed 22 different pharmaceuticals. So unfortunately not as many as, as we were able for water because the method is still in development for pharmaceuticals, but uh, out of the 22, only three were above detection limit. And that's always a bit disappointing when you really want to see like what is out there, because it doesn't, even if we only detected three, it doesn't mean that the rest of them are not there. So these were the ones that were, um, the constraints were high enough that we were able to see. But what was interesting, venlafaxine was coming out as the highest concentrations out of all these um, caffeine, carbamazepine, and venlafaxine. So let's look at the venlafaxine, which was antidepressant a little bit more closely. So here I'll summarize then all, this is a data based on uh, what was the venlafaxine concentration in fist muscle tissue across all the sites. So the first panel is reference sites, then we have upstream uh, discharge and downstream sites. And on the y-axis, we have venlafaxine in microspicular crab per wet weight from zero to 150. And, and on the x-axis, we have different species from blackfish to uh, tension yabby and the same list as, as I, so, I showed in a previous slide. So what was uh, clear was the venlafaxine uh, was the highest concentration were at the discharge point. And the concentrations were from limit of reporting, which was five micron per kilogram up to 150. And it was only detected um, in redfin perch. And when we look at then, um, especially the 150 micro, micrograms per kilogram, the result was a bit of a surprise. And we went back to the lab and really checked, like, is that the real result? And yes, it is. But when we then started looking at the data, it was an individual that was on one of the biggest one, well, the biggest ones that we caught, and it was a, um, a fish that weighed 448 grams, and it was 310 centimeters. So it was a decent size redfin. And when we look at the water body, like water weight, where we caught that from, actually from the downstream side, uh, the fish where the redfins that we uh, caught, they were showing venlafaxine as well. And we caught, um, so at the discharge point in that water where we caught three redfins, 
two had de detectable levels of venlafaxine. Uh, we caught four from downstream, and, and all of them had more than 25 micrograms per kilogram in the edible portion of their tissues. And upstream, none of them. We caught seven, and none of them had. So clearly, in this waterway, um, fish are exposed to venlafaxine. And just a reminder, like what were the water levels? Because it always is, we need to, yeah, traditionally, um, monitoring has been done based on water sampling. So it is, if we look at the waterway where the fish had such a high concentrations, you would be looking at these yellow, uh, uh, yellow boxes. So therefore the discharge point would have that uh, mean concentration was 0.5 micrograms per liter, which is high, but it might actually show any red flags at all. But looking at water levels, 0.5 micrograms per liter, our fish have up to 150 micrograms per kilogram. So definitely, again, uh, take home is, is that it's important to analyze both water and biota, so have a, a better understanding of the risks of these pharmaceuticals. Um, then just to uh, quickly go through, we, had, we did the traditional, we look at bioaccumulation factors uh, based on the levels we in the water and in tissues. And yes, there's evidence for bioaccumulation for venlafaxine and carbamazepine. And then my colleagues at the Environmental Public Health Unit, they did um, a margin of exposure calculations. And based on their calculations, there seems to be a relatively low public health risk for the consumption of venlafaxine and carbamazepine. But despite that, I think it's important that we are aware of the growing body of research that shows that exposure to venlafaxine is having uh, adverse effects on non-target organisms. And there is, there's only four uh, papers that I'm showing here, but there's tens and tens that show that um, exposure to venlafaxine uh, um, chases the brain serotonin levels in fish, uh, is highly uh, shows high bioaccumulation, reduces um, white brain larvae, survival of those larvae, um, reduces temporary production, and most importantly, it is changing the behavior of these organisms as well. And yes, some of these concentrations are relatively high, like 100 micros per liter, but then there's the Gallo study that exposed a superfish for 0.5 micrograms per liter, and we're showing reduced embryo production. So definitely the levels that we are already measuring in the environment are having, there's an evidence for adverse effects. And this was something that I discovered when I started to look into venlafaxine, that there's actually, actually um, growing, there's evidence that the, the current treat, the treatments are not really treating venlafaxine. So there's really low removal efficiency. And there's a study by Chen Nat Roberts, um, a colleague from CSR in and Adelaide, um, they actually showed that effluent concentrations were up to seven times higher than the influent concentrations when they were measuring venlafaxine. So it looks like there's a possibility that their transformation product is converting back to the parent compounds during treatment. So all these uh, things considered, I would say there's more work to be done. And, and looking at future directions for EPA, definitely ideally we need a more uh, strategic but a longer term monitoring plan that we can go back to the same sites and look at definitely go back to the same size, but also expand the network and look at what else is out there and what else, there's a lot of things that we didn't measure. We didn't look at levels in, 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 uh, in plants, uh, 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 in birds, <laughs> in, in, in vertebrates, or like, and we didn't look at sediment as well. So there's endless and knowledge gaps still there for us to uh, conquer. And to answer all those research questions and all the knowledge gaps, the key is then to collaborate and create partnerships to really get a better handle on uh, what are the risks of these pharmaceuticals. But we can do, uh, we need to be more active in developing guidelines and environmental reference standards for pharmaceuticals. And what we also can do, what we're doing today, we can start communicating and educating duty holders and decision makers of these potential risks of pharmaceuticals. And as a nation, what we should be um, moving towards to is promoting more uh, whole life cycle approach to pharmaceuticals, what the European Union is already doing, looking at actually designing better products and designing more green and uh, uh, promoting green and manufacturing and really questioning do we really need to use all those pharmaceuticals and are we using it for the right reasons? And then when we do use them, uh, let's make sure that we collect them properly we dispose them properly. And then they, when they end up in an, uh, the wastewater treatment plant, then they are treated to a level that causes the minimum harm to the environment. And to be able to, to do all that, we do need to develop better chemical strategies and action plans to really tackle pharmaceutical pollution. That was the end of my talk. Thank you. Now I hand over to my dear colleague, Thomas. Over to you.
Thank you very much for inviting me to, to share with you um, some of the work I've been doing for the last 15 years in, in the realm of pharmaceuticals in the environment and the ecological effects thereof. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a bit early in the morning here in Sweden, but uh, the early bird catches the worm, they say, and maybe, maybe I will today. Um, I will uh, give you a short introduction of, of pharmaceuticals in in the environment and um, and uh, let's see if the takeover of the seems to not work at the moment it was maybe now yeah there you go perfect or not perfect but good enough um, and the title of my talk is The Effects of Pharmaceuticals in the Environment, uh, Bridging the Gap Between Lab and Field. Uh, when I started working on ecological effects in pharm of pharmaceuticals in the environment um, about 15 years ago, we knew virtually nothing about uh, what potential effects were going on in, in the wild. We didn't know uh, what pharmaceuticals were out there even. Uh, some studies had been done but uh, we were pretty much uh, fumbling in the dark in the beginning. And especially as an ecologist, trying to figure out what uh, drugs, for example, to, to, to look for and, and uh, to analyze, uh, to expect effects of, is really hard. Um, and it was a struck of uh, luck that I um, held a talk at, at the Umeå University in Sweden. And one of my colleagues um, heard about my studies of animal behavior and, and animal personality as I was working with that at that time. And when he was driving home from, from the university that, that night, he heard a chemist speaking on the, on the radio, uh, Swedish science radio, telling everyone that uh, he's found 26 different pharmaceuticals in rainbow trout exposed to um, to wastewater. Um, and this uh, colleague of mine, he sent me a text like, he, this guy found uh, uh, pharmaceuticals in fish and you were talking about pharmaceuticals and how they might affect uh, um, fish behavior. Because I'm basically, my background is in evolutionary and behavioral ecology. And uh, um, so I set up a meeting with this uh, chemist that I never heard of, never seen. Um, and uh, it turned out he was uh, sitting three meters above me in the same house, uh, which just shows how airtight uh, the, the, the walls between chemistry and ecology can be even within the university. But we set up a meeting and in a room with no windows, it was re really cold. Um, the three of us, the guy who, who also were driving the car and, and listening to the radio, he was an environmental scientist. Uh, and also a, a food web specialist. And then we sat down, the four of us, and tried to design the first experiment. And I'll come back to this first experiment a little bit later in my talk. Um, I was gonna give an introduction to why pharmaceuticals are special and, and important, but, but Mina beautifully uh, presented that to you, but I'll, I'll just briefly run through it anyway. Um, but during my 15 years of, of studying pharmaceuticals, it's really been a huge increase in, in the awareness of that pharmaceuticals might actually be bad for us and that they are exposing wildlife globally. Um, when I started, um, the idea was that pharmaceuticals are good. If they are designed to do good for us, why should they harm the environment? And um, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a rationale behind that that statement and, and that belief. But as we now know, we, there are pharmaceuticals that endanger wildlife and ecosystem functioning and even human health. And uh, these are being excreted and uh, exposing uh, humans and uh, animals all over the world. Uh, as Mark said, we go through our slides uh, many times, but uh, as you can see in, down in, on this slide, it still says Spain and Sweden there, because most countries have little to no uh, regulation when it comes to pharmaceuticals. Uh, they are not 
uh, handled in the in the chemical act uh, in Sweden and because they are of, of utmost importance for human health and so they've been uh, excluded so the there are basically no rules or regulations of how uh, how much pharmaceuticals you can pollute um, and I'll come back to why that was a a good thing for us at one point um, later. Okay, so pharmaceuticals um, are increasing. Um, we heard about that in, in Mark's introduction. And I'm, I'm going to show you just in, in relations to other increasing uh, things in, in, in the world, how much pharmaceuticals actually are increasing. And this is um, atmospheric um, uh, carbon dioxide increase. I mean, we know about that increase. It's a lot about it in the, in the radio and in TV and media. Um, and it has tremendous effects globally, of course. Human population is also increasing, and this is between 1955 and 2015. And human increasing population is also affecting the, the, the world tremendously. But if we look at, oh, wrong way. If we look at the chemical industry output, which is here, you see that, that there's a huge proportional change since, especially since 1996, seven, uh, but all the way back to 1960s, been increasing a lot, the chemical industry output. And then if we look at pharmaceuticals, it's an enormous increase from 1995 to today or to 2015. And from 2015 to, till today, we have another 24% increase in pharmaceutical consumption. So there is a huge uh, burst of uh, pharmaceutical consumption. And of course, these pharmaceutical ends up in the environment, or at least many of them do, and potentially affects wildlife. So needless to say, we are living in a medicated world. Uh, the, the uh, pharmaceutical uh, pollution is, uh, is a global issue um, and we use a lot, uh, 4.5 trillion doses approximately per year. Um, there are five to 6,000 increasing daily almost products on the market and uh, over 600 pharmaceuticals have, have been detected in the environment today. Uh, I think it's actually over 700 now. Um, and it's been reported across 71 countries. And this has actually increased a, a lot as well since uh, Alistair Boxall's uh, recent study that he's uh, just about to publish. It's coming out within weeks, uh, where he had looked at, at the water uh, from uh, over 100 countries. And um, there are a lot of new world records when it comes to concentrations uh, of pharmaceuticals in the environment in that paper. Uh, scary and uh, but not unexpected. Okay, so when we think about um, how pharmaceuticals en enter the environment, it's often through um, this. This is often the way uh, through wastewater, and we have a bunch of different uh, types of pharmaceuticals in these wastewaters. These are a few of the groups that we have either been. Um, looking at ecological effects of or bioconcentration of uh, in, in um, aquatic wildlife. Um, at the moment, we're working mainly with anti-anxiety drugs and uh, fiddling a little bit with, with uh, antihistamines and antibiotics. Um, and why are pharmaceuticals different from other um, chemicals? Well, one important reason is that they are designed to have a biological effect at low doses. And so you, when you do uh, ecotoxicological tests on pharmaceuticals, uh, you're looking for toxic uh, effects. You're looking for, but I mean, pharmaceuticals are not, they're designed to be not toxic. <laughs> they're designed to be good, uh, at least most of them. And uh, so you're going to go, have to go really, really high in concentrations to find any toxic effects of, of pharmaceuticals. Instead, you will get, uh, you'll find uh, therapeutic effects or pharmaceutical, pharmacological effects at very low concentrations. But those um, effects will usually go um, unseen in these eco ecotox tests that we're doing today. And I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. 
they are also persistent or semi-persistent in the environment. Many are designed to be really uh, stable because the human body is a really hostile environment and, and it has to uh, stay as stable as possible because many of the metabolites of pharmaceuticals can be uh, dangerous for us or have even stronger effects than the mother compounds. Um, another thing that, that makes pharmaceuticals important and special is that they are acting on drug targets that are often evolutionary conserved across phyla. Uh, and this was shown beautifully by uh, Gunnarsson et al. in 2008, where they, they, they pretty much show that uh, when it comes to pharmaceutical exposure, a fish is very, very like a, a human. We are sharing a lot of these drug targets and hence um, the effects of pharmaceuticals in humans might also be present in fish. Finally, many of the pharmaceuticals have been shown to bioaccumulated and bioconcentrate in organisms. Um, and some has been shown to biomagnify, but it's not at all as uh, um, straightforward as it is in many of the, the legacy contaminants where it's the bio, biomagnification is really um, predictable. Uh, it's not at all like that in pharmaceuticals. And we can talk about that after this talk if you want to. Um, so the first time I got in contact with uh, any effects of pharmaceuticals in the environment is this classic uh, study or this classic uh, effect, this tremendous tragedy of, of the vultures in, in, in Southeast Asia, um, where vultures died like flies. 99.7% um, of this particular vulture was uh, eradicated in, in just a few years. Um, and no one knew why. Um, as it turned out, after many years of, of uh, detective work, they found out that it was diclofenac, the anti-inflammatory drug that they give to livestock that, that caused kidney failure in these vultures and they died. A side effect of a pharmaceutical in the environment that no one could predict um, before it happened. Um, but it had tremendous ecological effects because not only did the vultures die, they are the ones that are cleaning up from uh, livestock walking around freely and topping over and dying. Um, and when the vultures weren't there, the wild dogs stepped in and uh, increased exponentially with a um, huge uh, burst of, of uh, rabies following and also the wild dogs wreaking havoc in the, in the natural uh, environment, uh, killing a lot of and reducing the populations of a lot of uh, native fauna. So this was sort of the first time I um, got in contact or heard about ecological effects of, of pharmaceuticals in the environment. Uh, apart from this study, there's also another famous one um, that also showed if ecological effects of pharmaceuticals in the environment, uh, which is the intersexuality of, of wild populations of fish, uh, mainly roach in, in the UK. Um, because of the, the contraceptive pills that were um, excreted and, and uh, going out with the wastewater into the rivers. And this was a long time ago, or a long time, but it, it was um, 20 years ago, a little bit more even, um, that they found out uh, and showed this. And uh, we still can see about one fourth of, of the roach in UK show sign of sex reversal still. Uh, 20, almost 25 years later. Um, so we haven't really dealt with the problem. And, and I was at the CTAC meeting not long ago um, where we're, we were discussing the level, at what level should we say that, that it is okay to, to um, um, well, to, to flush out, to, to, at what level can we accept contraceptives uh, or hormone disruptive compounds in rivers and streams. And um, we were suggesting the, the no effect concentration, um, predicted no effect concentration. But then it turned out that um, over 75% of all streams in the UK would not pass this environmental uh, level. Um, so they had a suggestion that we double the level because then there would be, wouldn't be a problem anymore. The problem would have gone away. Uh, so 
So, and as for me as an ecologist, that is really <laughs> not the way to solve a problem. The problem doesn't go away just because you increase the, the threshold that you are, can accept. Uh, the, the problem goes away if you remove or reduce the exposure for the, the wildlife. And this all sparked my, my need and my will to, to improve uh, the ecological relevance of uh, ecotoxicological testing and, and also of the risk assessment of pharmaceuticals and other compounds. Most studies have, uh, of, of the pharmaceuticals have been done in, in the lab. And uh, I started in the lab too. And th these are a few of uh, great examples of, of lab studies that has been done, looking at how um, pharmaceuticals can affect um, behaviors uh, or um, other, well, I would say behaviors uh, connected to reproduction. And uh, these, of course, are extremely important behaviors, but also behaviors that are usually very hard uh, to, to change because they, they are really important for the organism and has been selected for over, uh, with strong selection over a long time. So the fact that these pharmaceuticals can change these behaviors that are so strongly selected for is really showing that pharmaceuticals are a powerful um, contaminant. That, that can be very dangerous at high, uh, for the environment at high uh, concentrations, uh, rather low concentrations, but high enough to, to cause harm. And I started by saying that I was an evolutionary and behavioral ecologist. And, and so my first thought of increasing the re realism of, of pharmaceutical um, risk assessment or um, yeah, the inc increasing the ecological relevance of, of ecotox tests was to use behavioral endpoints for behaviorally modifying drugs. That's sort of a no brainer um, because behavior is a, really the, the link between the, the physiology of the individual and its environment. And, and behavior is a very, very sensitive endpoint as well because before you start to ha have individuals dying, they sure have, will have uh, changed the behavior. And it's been shown that many times uh, behavioral endpoints can be up to a thousand times more sensitive than uh, the, the regular uh, commonly used endpoints, such as morphological changes or reproductive changes or um, lethal dose 50 endpoints. And then, um, at, when I started um, back in, in, in that cold room without no windows, um, behavioral endpoints had, had received fairly little uh, attention. There's been some behavioral studies, but most of them had been on um, looking at like, behavior as a side effect. Well, they, they took notes that the fish were swimming upside down in the tank while they were exposed to this chemical, uh, which is not really the behavior I was looking for. I was more interested in looking at uh, behavioral endpoints that were ecologically relevant and had a solid uh, ecological theory that I could back it up with. So in that room, we decided that we wanted to use an ecologically relevant drug with ecologically relevant concentration on an ecologically relevant species and look at ecologically relevant endpoints in that species. And the chemist um, that I never met before suggested we should use one of the benzodiazepines. He said, I will go and check which one is, is most predominant in, in the test, the wastewater um, or the rivers we've been sampling. We'll go up, out and sample more and then we'll decide. And when he came back, he suggested oxazepam, which Mina found in, in her water sampling now as well, because it's a very commonly used Benzodiazepine. Uh, benzodiazepines are anti-anxiety drugs, but also used to in, for uh, inducing sleep in elders, for example. And, and uh, there are about 20 to 25 of them. Many have been um, taken off the shelves, uh, but are some of them are only sold in the black market because they are nar narcotic uh, narcotics. Um, but uh, many are are used, and many are excreted in the same streams. 
Oxazepam is one of the um, most least potent of the benzodiazepines as well. I want to say that uh, before we move on. And they work on the GABA A, uh, GABA receptor subunit A. So this is the evolutionary conserved um, drug target that, that the benzodiazepines work on. It's both in humans and in all other vertebrates. So we expected that if it changes the behavior in humans, it might also change the behavior in fish. Mina's already talked about how pharmaceuticals end up in the environment, but where in the environment do they end up? And we went out, like I said, and sampling a bunch of rivers, looking at benzodiazepines. Uh, where are they? What kind of benzodiazepines can we find? Are they even there? And we started out in, in smaller rivers with a lot of people around. And the, this is an example from the UK, the area in the Calder River Basin. And as you can see, we found a lot of benzodiazepines in the small rivers. Then we upped our game and looked at uh, the huge river Danube that runs through most of Europe. A really big river, a lot of the dilution, and we find benzodiazepines all along the Danube. Um, which was both uh, exciting and disturbing for us. Um, since then, we moved out into the ocean to, to test if we can find pharmaceuticals even in, in the sea. Uh, to the right, you have the Baltic Sea. Sweden is um, to the left of, of the map, uh, the sea, Blue Sea. And Finland, Mina, is to the right. <laughs> And um, the numbers in, uh, on that C, 1 to 43, I think, uh, are the sites where we took water samples at uh, surface water and 20 meters deep. And in all these sites, we find pharmaceuticals, except one and two, up north where no one lives. And there's a huge input of fresh water. Uh, with, because there are deep, large rivers coming out from uh, uninhabited areas. But from the number sample site three and down, we find pharmaceuticals in all our samples. Um, many pharmaceuticals when we get close to this um, to the land, and fewer out in the in the pelagic uh, areas. One pharmaceutical that we found in all samples in the Baltic is carbamazepine. Uh, that also Mina found, I think, in, in her samples. Um, it's a super stable drug. And, and we had a, um, an engi engineer calculate how much or carbamazepine there is in, in the Baltic Sea. And it turns out that 89% of all prescribed um, uh, carbamazepine around the Baltic has, are now in the Baltic. Um, there is still no half-life of carbamazepine in the, in the wild because it's so stable. So we're slowly marinating our, our fish in, in the Baltic. I'm doing a um, collaborative study with a, a Swedish uh, a marine agency, water and marine agency, about looking at the effects of pharmaceutical in cod because we've seen high, high levels of, of um, hormone disruptive compounds in cod in the Baltic Sea which is disturbing, 5,000 times higher than, than what uh, shows a reproductive uh, change in lab, which is, yeah, that's just mind blowing. And we're also um, sampling in outside of uh, Florida, together with Florida International University, looking at the potential effects of pharmaceuticals on the collapse of the bonefish population out there. That's a famous and, and um, liked sport fish. So basically, wherever we look, we find pharmaceuticals. Um, but admittedly, most of them are in very low levels in, in the ocean, in the sea. But they are there still, and they are increasing. OK. So now over to what we are doing. <laughs> it's a long spiel background of my, my way into this field. but. Now in the, in the lab, we are looking at ecological effects of human activities and pharmaceuticals, climate change, all of these together. Um, we're, also, we're both looking at, at, at the pharmaceutical effects uh, singly, alone, but we're also looking at indirect effects of other things at the same time. 
So how, for example, the interaction of, of climate change and pharmaceutical will, will act? Uh, because are we really measuring the risk or assessing the risk of, of pharmaceuticals for the future, or is it just valid for today? If we have um, a temperature increase of two degrees in the water or the maximum degree um, temperature increase in the water of five degrees, even, um, what will that, uh, how will that affect um, the, the risk of being exposed to different uh, chemicals and, and pharmaceuticals? So we're looking at these direct effects and indirect effects of human activities, basically, um, and how, how this effect predominantly fish, but also insects and, and crayfish and other, other things. In the lab, where we look at the mechanistic, uh, realistic, um, or mechanistic and, and, and low complexity things, uh, why, what happens, what's, what's the reason why we see this. And then we move into uh, artificial ponds where we can follow the fish and see if we still um, see the same effects in a semi-natural environment. And finally, we have a um, lake area in the interior of Sweden where we can do um, full lake studies um, following individual fish uh, on high resolution. And I'll come back to how we do that later. But then we can actually get to the $100 million question of what is going on in the lake with all the complexity and, and interacting effects that, that, that's out there. Back to that room, no windows, cold, uh, me and a chemist. The most important thing that we did before going into that room was leaving um, our egos outside the door. Uh, we said that, okay, let's just be crazy. Just talk openly, no, no prestige. Um, and that was very important because all, we were all shot down by each other at least 10 times before we reached uh, the final um, design of the study. And, and the design was, uh, as it turned out, really successful. I, I have the chemist to thank for that because he chose the compound and that's the most important thing in this case. But we, we chose um, the ecologically relevant species perch um, because it's a really common species in the, all over Europe and Asia. And I think it's an invasive species in Australia even or at least then it's introduced. Um, and we exposed, decided to expose it to field realistic levels of the drug oxazepam that we found in these um, river samples that we looked at. And what we saw um, of the behavioral endpoints we looked at, because we decided to look at, since I've been working with animal personality, there is a big five in, in, in uh, fish or animals as it is in humans, it's activity, exploration, sociality, uh, boldness, and um, activity. Did I say that? Oh, maybe. Anyway, we, we chose to look at activity, sociality, and boldness. Boldness is risk-taking, basically. And what we saw when we exposed them to these field realistic levels was that it, it increased their activity and it reduced their sociality. So they were more active, less interested in schooling. This is a schooling fish. Um, and they also became, uh, especially at higher levels, more bold, more risk-taking. So we did this experiment and we re realized that, ah, okay, now we know that they change behavior, but what does it mean? How does it affect the perch ability to be a perch? So then we redid the entire experiment once again. Um, and we added, uh, a feeding assay at the end to see how it would affect an um, ecolo ecological endpoint, how the behavioral changes would affect an ecological endpoint like feeding. Uh, that is very important for fitness in, in, and growth. And again, we saw the same behavioral effects and to our surprise, we saw increased feeding efficiency in the perch. So what the drug actually did was making the, the perch better they fed faster, they would grow faster with, with this anti-anxiety drug, oxazepam in the water. But then of course we did, there's also a flip side of that, that increased activity, reduced sociality, increased boldness uh, coin. 
um, if you are more active and more, less social, you don't seek protection with the, the group and you're also more risk taking, you're going to expose yourself more to predation. So we did a predation trial as well and saw that, um, well, we had uh, actually it's pretty awesome, or awful, I mean, to look at the, the videos because we, we had a staged um, huge tank, or we had many huge tanks, uh, three times one times one meter, one pike, which is predatory fish in the one, one end, two perch, one exposed and one non-exposed in the other. And then we open up for the fish to interact and video recorded all these interactions. And we did that uh, 18 times. And 16 of the 18 times the exposed perch was eaten first by the, by the pike. And in the other two times, no perch was eaten. So the, the normal unexposed perch were never taken by the, by the pike in the presence of an exposed uh, perch. And you could also just see on the perch when you introduced it into the tank, um, even though it could not see the predator, it felt the chemical cues of it because the, the normal perch turned black and just sank to the bottom and lay there. I'm a stone, I'm a stone, I'm a stone. Whereas the, the exposed perch was just swimming around happily as, as ever. And, and some of the videos even show that when you, when you open up the, the doors for, for them to, to gain access to the entire tank, uh, some of the exposed uh, perch seem to just see the pike on the other end and swam straight up for it and uh, wanted to know what's going on over there. Um, so they sort of removed the fear in the in their perch, which uh, were deadly, a deadly consequence, uh, which of course in the, in the field would also be very detrimental for the perch population. Uh, luckily, uh, another study showed that the per, uh, pike also become, becomes sloppy feeders when you expose them to, to access the PAM, so that, that's a different story. Okay. So then we had, we knew what was going on in the, in the lab and we wanted to know, well, okay, is this true in the field as well? So what we did here was we, this was our first attempt to bridge the gap between lab and field. And here we did a lab exposure of, of fish. And then we introduced them in a fishless lake in this uh, lake area that we had. And the blue dots are the predatory pike and the red dots are exposed perch and the yellow dots are the unexposed perch. Now I no. Now I'm gonna try and see if I can get the, this video going. No, I can't. Maybe it's the remote control that that is uh, not screwing up the video. Anyway, there it is. Perfect. No. A uh, little help from our friends. Thank you. So the blue dots are the the pike, and we introduced them first, just so they get familiar with the, the area, and then we introduced the row uh, the the perch. And the red dots are the exposed ones. And you see the red dots starting to move out while the yellow dots are still in the, in the introduction area. If you look at the, the lines being created in these squares, um, you have a, a red line and a yellow line. And the red line, of course, is the exposed fish and the yellow line is the non-exposed. And what these, these curves show is that Fish that were exposed to oxazepam were more uh, risk taking than fish that were not. And fish that were more that were exposed to oxazepam were also more asocial. Uh, if you look at the, the lower right uh, graph, it's uh, distance to nearest two neighbors. So 
red means that they were more asocial. So we've shown the same um, behavioral effects here in, in this short term uh, field study. This is just a, you can see it's five, six days, um, because if you see in the upper right, it's the elimination curve. If you take fish that has been exposed to pharmaceuticals and put them in clean water, it slowly enters steady state with the water. So they sort of clean themselves over time. So this was exciting and scary. We shown that that what we see in the in the lab can also happen in in a full lake in the field. The behavioral effects. Um, let's see if I can. Did I? Trying to move on here. There you go. So that's the first example where where we. Took, took a step out in, into, the nat into nature and, and try to bridge this gap. Um, this is sort of the start of the second attempt. Uh, I'm working in a, in a really salmon heavy department at the moment. And it was expected of me to work with salmon as well when they, they hired me. Um, so I, I thought, okay, let's, let's see if, if pharmaceuticals might affect something really really important in salmon, their migration. So we did a, a lab study and these are uh, migration chambers, or tanks, you can see here um, in the picture. Uh, they are eight meters across and are fed with uh, river water. And you can measure, if you uh, mark the fish with pit tags, which is uh, basically barcodes that you can use to identify fish. Um, and then you measure how many laps they swim in a certain time. And they should swim downstream because these are small salmon moving downstream from their river to the sea. Um, and what we saw when, when we looked at exposed and non-exposed was that exposed fish were migrating much more e efficiently or more with higher intensity. Um, so they would reach the, the sea faster than, than the non-exposed. And the guys at the aquacultural facility were really excited about this. They were like, wow, now we need to prep all our, our salmon with, with oxazepam because they will, the most dangerous part of a salmon's life is when it's moving from a familiar habitat downstream through an unfamiliar habitat with all kinds of dangers into the, into the sea. Uh, so they wanted to reduce the time that it, the, the salmon was exposed to these, these dangers. Now we said, hold on a bit, <laughs> not yet. Uh, we want to test this in the field as well. Is it really valid? So we went out into a small uh, tributary to the Ume River, a big one. Um, and we put out these Pitag antennas again and looked at um, how long did it take for these salmon um, and trouts later as well uh, to, to migrate uh, from our release point down to the, the mouth of the tributary into the, into the river. And again, we saw the same effect. They were faster, much faster when they were exposed than when they were not. Uh, and the same when uh, goes for 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 sea trout also migrating species uh, that migrates out to the, the, the sea um, in this case we used oxazepam for the salmon and temazepam another ox benzodiazepine for the trout but we saw the same effects the guys at the aquacultural facility were ecstatic yes now you've shown it let's order some oxa and uh, expose them so we'll have a higher survival and we said, ah, not yet, not yet, because we need to test it in the real river. The Ume River with all its complexity and all its predators and everything that's going on there. One final study. And they said, okay, let's see these scientists. And then we, so we, then we used acoustic telemetry as a method to track the fish instead of uh, pit tagging them. And acoustic telemetry is a really nice and uh, fastly developing field of uh, field equipment that uh, you tag a fish with a small transmitter 
that um, sends out a signal, an individual signal that makes you able to yeah, identify the individual fish. And then you have um, receivers that you put out along the, the river or in a grid if it's in, in the lake. Um, and so we did the, this in, in um, the Ume River and we exposed fish to oxazepam or had control fish. And then they migrated from up, uh, position upstream. It was 27 kilometers upstream and all the way down to the Gulf of Botnia. And when we got the results from this study, we were less keen on exposing them. To, this is a really ugly, ugly figure, but it's, it is what it is at the moment. <laughs> uh, we had 18 um, salmon per treatment. 18 exposed and 18 unexposed. And even 100 meters after we released them, we already lost two of the uh, exposed fish. They never reached the first um, receiver. And half the way through the, the migration, we already we only had six individuals left out of 18 of the exposed ones, where, whereas we had 15 of the normal uh, fish. And only three of the exposed ones made it to the ocean or the, or the sea, whereas 12 of the non-exposed. So here we, we shown that, that even though it looks like, and the ecological theory predicted that oxazepam should increase, or even any benzodiazepine probably, should increase the survival of the uh, salmon um, because it would reduce the time it spent, spends in the river it did actually the opposite. It reduced survival. And as it turned out, we had a great French intern that worked really hard uh, trying to find these um, transmitters in the river where they were. And also, um, also he was an extremely keen fisherman. So he fished a lot. Um, and he, he showed a beautiful correlation between where the transmitters ended up and pike densities. Um, so these fish that are exposed to, to benzodiazepines get eaten by, by pike and large perch in the river. They are not afraid. They are swimming fast and don't care about risk at all. So no uh, exposing of, of um, salmons to benzodiazepines in, in that aquaculture facility at least. Okay, moving on. Uh, now I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'm, I'm gonna end my talk with a couple of other things that we are doing that I think is really exciting and, and uh, important. One is this um, study that I did collaboration with the uh, with, um, Monash University and Aaron Richmond, uh, Bob Wong and many, many others. Um, it, it's a, uh, or uh, yeah, I was going to Monash University visiting Bob Wong and Mina uh, way back and, uh, and stumbled over this fantastic um, material that was just lying around uh, me and my pet chemist were uh, <laughs> excited about it and brought it back with us to Sweden and analyzed it. And uh, from that, we were able to show that, that pharmaceuticals actually um, are flowing from the streams up into the terrestrial environment uh, via aquatic emerging insects into spiders and other animals like bats and birds. Um, there are more studies on this topic now. Uh, this was the first one when it came out, but now it's been shown uh, repeatedly. And we also done did a, a huge study in Sweden where we uh, had uh, 600 sites uh, sampling water and, and invertebrates and spiders. Um, unfortunately, with these huge studies, it takes a lot, lot of long, long time to publish them because there's so much data. So it's still not published, but it will be. Uh, but this is something really important and, and new because we, we found really high levels of pharmaceuticals in the riparian spiders, much higher than in many of the aquatic insects. So uh, underestimate or not 
um, st studied enough field, uh, this, uh, this uh, pharmaceutical flow. Another important thing that we're doing now is, is of course, looking at individual compounds versus, versus mi mixtures, and not only mixtures uh, of uh, mother pharmaceuticals uh, or real pharmaceuticals, but also the effects of exposure to the metabolites that the pharmaceuticals uh, turn into. And we had a publication recently where we show that um, fish is actually, can actually be more exposed to um, we expose the fish to oxazepam and another uh, benzodiazepine, which break down uh, the metabolite of that benzodiazepine is oxazepam. And the, the fish were more exposed by the breakdown of the other benzo to oxazepam and to oxazepam itself, uh, which is fantastic. So the fish that were swimming in, in one of the, for example, in, in, in temazepam, were exposed to more oxazepam than the fish that were swimming in oxazepam. Um, so that is another um, thing that I, another issue that I think is not um, studied enough, um, the combinatory effects of not only individual compounds, but also the, the metabolites and how that in turn might um, spiral into increased bioconcentration um, and, and increased uh, behavioral effects. Finally, um, I'm going to end with the wild caught zebrafish versus lab zebrafish. And this is uh, something that, uh, that's been a pet peeve of mine since the beginning, because um, there, I think, as at least when we're looking at behavioral, behavioral endpoints, we can't, we can't use um, laboratory species or species that have been in laboratory for many generations because they've been selected for a certain repertoire of behavioral uh, characteristics. Uh, often high, this, they often live in a luxury uh, environment with no predation and no risk. And, and we did an experiment together with uh, Laura Watson in, in Uppsala, uh, where she looked at wild caught zebrafish from straight from the, the Bengal. And laboratory zebrafish that have been bred in the lab for hundreds of generations and exposed them to oxazepam for seven days and in the wild caught zebrafish we found clear behavioral effects and in the laboratory zebrafish absolutely no effects at all. Um, this is disturbing since when we look at risk assessments or we do risk assessments we often use uh, laboratory bred zebrafish or uh, fat-headed minnows or, or species like that, but they might not, at least when you look at behavioral endpoints, uh, represent the real risk um, that is to wild uh, animals. Okay, uh, with that I want to acknowledge all of the fantastic people that uh, has been uh, working with me in the lab. Um, these guys have done all the work I've been looking and nodding and humming. Um, and I want to thank you all for, for uh, logging in, listening, and I have to thank the money, of course, that made this, all this research possible. And I also want to make a little push for, um, there's a paper that came out a little while ago about the role of behavioral toxicology in environmental protection. And uh, please, have a look at this paper. I think it, it might be interesting for many of you. And with that, I end my talk and are happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Thomas, that was just mind-bogglingly frightening, to be frank. Um, it reminded me of my first exposure, so to speak, to this issue, which was in a movie called The Disappearing Male. And I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it that was over a decade ago I saw that and it really it, it really sort of sparks you know sparks my interest in the topic your work also reminds me of Rachel Carson's journey many years ago and it's an emerging problem and what I can see from your talk is the consequences of um, these pharmaceuticals not only on the animals but on the outcomes for the animals and it's made me, made me think when you were given this information, if it's doing this to the, the fish, 
it must be doing it to the people. And does it mean that the people who are using some of these pharmaceuticals, for example, um, and I'm thinking about the Osmopan, it's, it's the same for many of the drugs, whether those who are involved in road accidents are people who've been exposed or have greater exposure because they take greater risks. And, uh, and that, I mean, I'm, you must have thought, no doubt you've thought of that during your many journeys. And, you know, somebody will be picking that up or looking at it. And, I, I, you know, there'll be some great opportunities. And, mm. uh, of course, the, the, the final comment you made in regard to the errors that we might, systematic errors that we might be making in our toxicological assessments by using lab fish versus wild fish, was, I just think that is really deep insight. And we could be making gross mistakes about understanding the effort, efforts, sorry, the, the effects of these pharmaceuticals not only on the species, but on humans. So um, you may wish to comment on some of that and then I can move into some uh, a myriad of questions that have been provided. Yes, first of all, the human aspect. And I've been so tempted to, to, to do some human behavioral uh, tests and studies, but it's really hard. And uh, I've been staying out of it because of the extreme hassle of doing human studies uh, ethical wise and also the problem of getting um, the, getting the information of who's actually using what product it's very it's a classifier putting my professor hat on Thomas I make a suggestion to you you could really go and you look at cadavers because you'd understand what had happened to the cadavers and that may be a way to sort of to start some of that preliminary research because the cadavers have given their bodies away for scientific research that's would be possibly you know a, you know a good project for a you know an early researcher an honors project or a master's project to look at that anyway sorry carry on yes and for the second part uh i truly think that we are uh at least for some compounds gravely underestimating the ecological risk. Uh, the assessment is, is not designed, the, the, the test in itself is not designed for, for testing for risk of pharmaceuticals. Um, it's not testing the, the therapeutic effect. And the, we're not using the proper, in some cases, at least the proper organisms or the pheno proper yeah. phenotype. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. So if I can go to uh, some of the questions and answers that have been provided by the audience. I've got five questions, it says here. Um, Oliver James has asked, uh, raised the questions, and this is fascinating work, which I agree with, and, and great talks, and including Minna. And they're asking of you, Minna, are you going to publish the data? If so, where? As a journal article or a report? Good question, and thank you, Oliver, because you know that you're in the audience. Uh, yes, we are publishing as a journal article, and this is a good, good Good. Um, now, when we have such a nice audience, you could share this news that uh, EPA does publish um, data as journal articles as well. Maybe traditionally we'd be publishing them as more like technical reports or EPA reports, but there is definitely more emphasis now on writing journal articles because then they are more um, openly available for a broader audience and then um, you can actually see. And also the peer review stage is really important. So it's important that any work that we do goes through the peer, the peer review and then we get the feedback and then we can improve work like any scientist and any scientist uh, working at the our government. So yeah, journal, is, journal article is coming up. We are writing it as, as, as I speak. That's fantastic. And as the chief environmental scientist, I will not encourage you enough to do that. And I'll be there and my office will be there to support you. So related question uh, from Dr. Amy Heffernan is how many PPCPs did you test for? Was it 72? It was 72. Yeah, 72 in the water and 22 in fish. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. And um, so far on my list, Thomas, you can relax early morning. Fantastic. Other questions are coming through for a minute, but I now have received some more for you. So I'll come to you in a minute. Uh, uh, minute it's an anonymous person. Is asking what were the climate conditions when the samples were collecting? Dry times, discharges, uh, etc. And it's a question that also crossed my mind: was discharge an influencing factor on the concentrations that you measured? 
No, the very good point. And yes, so as, as I mentioned, we started sampling in March, which is in Australia, it's a late summer and early autumn. So it went from March to April. It was around the first lockdown. So there were some delays. We were not able to do everything within four weeks as planned. So there was a window of two, six to eight weeks that we were uh, going uh, collecting the samples. So there would have been different types of weather conditions. But yes, it's very important to consider all those factors when we start uh, then again, integrating the results. So what do these mean? Because yes, definitely the, the water conditions and then also, as I mentioned, the flow of the waste. Like if it's actually if it's not that much uh, waste coming through the plant, then the levels might be lower. And therefore then whatever then outcomes where how we estimate the risks might be biased by, by the conditions that were present during those times that we were sampling. But and, Mark, and this... Mark, we had effluent samples as well, but we didn't have it for all those sites. So that's why I didn't present that today. Okay, and um, I'll just leave it this with you to think there were the same person asked about accounting for fish mobility when it uh, assesses their exposure. Yeah. yeah so okay. uh, I want to move on, move on to Thomas yeah. mm -hmm. to make sure we have enough time for uh, questions. So a uh, question from Paul asks, to what extent do some of the pharmaceuticals in water bioaccumulate up the food chain? For example, are there more fat soluble drugs in big predatory fish versus small pre prey fish? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a complicated question because it's so compound specific um, and species specific as well. So uh, liquid content does not explain um, more than, yeah, less than 50% of the variation in, in um, bioaccumulation in, in fish uh, by concentration. There are other things going on uh, with pharmaceuticals than, than uh, regular um, contaminants. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't seen a, a straight, when, or in our studies, we haven't seen a straightforward uh, increase in every sort of step in the food chain, rather, it's, it depends on the more on the physiology of the in, and the exposure routes of the, uh, the organisms. We often see really, really high levels of many different pharmaceuticals in snails, for example. Um, so anything eating snails are in big trouble uh, because uh, probably because it, a snail is really exposed to the environment, to the water. Um, so the they bioaccumulate a lot and then they also eat the uh, uh, eat algae and algae are also often very high in in forms of content uh, the ones that we have been looking at at least um, and so, but when you go up into fish um they they steady they steady state against the water so so they are often lower uh, they often are exposed to lower levels than than the than the snails and the algae. Because um, they have this active getting rid of uh, excretion system that they, they use right. to. So they, they sort of end up in a steady state with the water. And bioconcentration can be really, I mean, vary a lot between species. Even within fish, it can vary between 0 0.8, for example, with the crucian carp that has less uh, pharmaceutical in their bodies than what we found in water. Uh, this is for oxazepam. Whereas um, perch that we started out with, um, looking at uh, the effect on perch, they have about 12 times higher concentration in their bodies than they are in the water. This means that if crucian carp and the perch swims in the same pond, the perch will be exposed to 14 times higher concentrations of oxazepam than the crucian carp, even though they are in the same water. Um, which means that uh, many of the pharmaceuticals will have asymmetrical effects in, in food webs. And asymmetrical effects, that means that they expose some or affect some individuals or some species and not other. And the asymmetrical effects are the ones that we are most afraid of because they are most likely, likely to have huge huge uh, uh, consequences for the, uh, for the food web and for the ecosystem. The, what you're saying reminds me somewhat of 
uh, emerging understanding of PFAS. And we know that uh, PFAS is, accumulates and um, is removed from different animals at different rates. And we typically rely on animal models to try and understand human health effects. But I think what you're saying is probably what you're saying, if I can unpick that, is that we can't probably rely on animal models because they all, all behave differently in response to the pharmaceuticals, which creates yeah. a very significant problem in understanding what constitutes, uh, you know, a safe level and what the dose response is. And do any of that? Somebody's asked also: Do any of these pharmaceuticals? Is there an established threshold of safety, and or is that unknown? There are a lot of thresholds of, of safety and, and predicted no effect concentrations of all of them, but they are all based on uh, the regular ecotox tests that you do for any chemical. Uh, lab fish. Many, many of them, uh, I think that most of them are uh, way too high. So actually, I, you've just opened the door on unpicking that. That would be a great piece of research. You wouldn't have to get your hands dirty on humans. You'd just be able to demonstrate that the toxicological assessments are invalid. That would be a really insightful piece of research. And you've probably already thought that anyway, so I don't know why I mentioned it. So moving on uh, to, to other questions. Um, this is a question uh, for, for Minna. What risk assessment were you, uh, were you looking at? Was it a single compound or... Um, or a, a mixture of exp a mixture of compounds. For example, what is the risk when you consider all of the drugs together? And uh, Thomas, you may also want to chip into this, including other uh, contaminants such as PFAS and other endo endocrine disruptors that uh, the fish may be exposed to. And how would that relate to human health risks? Is the other question that comes on there? No, no, that's a good point. That actually links to what Thomas was saying. Yes, uh, the risk assessment that I provided, it was based on single uh, chemicals. And, and therefore, even though based on single chemical analysis, the risk is low, the fact is that the uh, animals are exposed to, um, that when, when you eat a fish, you are likely to be exposed to a mixture of chemicals that are in the fish, that we only measured 22. They're, they're going to be more than 22 in there that we didn't even look at. So it's, uh, the risk assessment should be based on mixtures, but we haven't um, done that yet, that work. And, and as, as Thomas mentioned, it is quite of a, a new area. Uh, there's a lot of risk assessments out there and the guidelines are limited. So it's a bit early to talk about safe levels. More work needs to be done. But what are you thinking, Thomas? What would be your advice for regulator? Uh, it's, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> as always. But it, I, I mean, one of the things that strikes me uh, when you look at mixtures is that there are many, many, many mixtures or combinations of pharmaceuticals that would never, ever be prescribed to a human being at the same time. Completely forbidden because they have such huge side effects together. But these fish are exposed to the, to the combination of many of these um, uh, these, common, these dangerous or bad combinations that would never be prescribed to humans. And those, I haven't seen a single study looking at th that, uh, those types of mixtures. You rather look at mixtures of um, different, different types of antidepressants or different types of anxiolytics. Or, um, but what about those types of mixtures? I, I think that that would be a really interesting uh, venue to open up. Thomas, I would wager, I would wager that you will not be able to find a safe threshold for most of those mixtures. I think that that that's what the outcome is for the assessment of many chemicals and compounds. We, you know, the, the more we understand about low level exposures, often the exposure is greatest per unit of exposure. The effects are greatest per unit of exposure because it's a super linear curve at the first and lowest exposures. Now, I suspect we're only at the beginning of that journey and you're lucky to be at the start of that journey. So I, I've got some other questions uh, that have come through uh, that I'd like to ask. So maybe we can talk about what, you know, what could the community do as individuals to contribute to reducing the pharmaceutical load going into wastewaters? I mean, it's a fairly straightforward question, but 
could you cast your professional mind to that and give some advice? Should I start? Yes, Thomas. Okay. And then Minna. First of all, um, ask your uh, physician or whoever prescribes your med medication if it's uh, the environmentally friendly version. I mean, there are many options when it comes to most of the um, the med um, uh, yeah the pharmaceuticals uh, that you can take. And still, at the moment, there are very few that are like a green green drugs. There is a movement towards um, um, having a stamp, sort of a, a green fish or something like that, on some of the, the pharmaceuticals. So you are uh, able to choose the better product for the environment. Uh, but we need to ask for it first. So ask for it, because that builds a pressure for, for the pharmaceutical companies to develop it. Um, otherwise, it will take a long time. So that's one... Uh, proactive uh, suggestion. Um, Thank you. Apart from that, um, I don't think anyone should reduce their medication that they need. Uh, we, we need, many of us need medication and m might not be around without it. Uh, I don't want to advocate people stop using pharmaceuticals at all. But, um, um, I think that the solution, the, the short-term solution, uh, rather short-term solution, is cleaning of the wastewater. There is that's where the sh rather short-term solution is, and the long-term solution is green drug design. Um, so, so, but the, both of those are not things that that you can do at home. So, don't flush the uh, pharmaceuticals down the toilet. Return them to your pharmacy and ask for green drugs. That, that's my excellent. Uh, Minna, do you uh, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it's just a minor minor thing. Uh, speaking to the Australian audience, that there is a return unwanted medicines scheme in Australia. So if you Google that, you will be able to find the pharmacies that actually take your old or unused med, uh, um, medication. So it's worthwhile checking if, because not every pharmacist will do that. So then when you're moving out or cleaning now when we're in lockdown, I'm sure we are cleaning our cupboards. So pile those up and then check the website and, and take them to a pharmacist that will look after them properly. Thank you. So a couple more questions are coming through and, and just give me the nod when you've, uh, you decide you'd like to terminate that you've had enough and need to get breakfast or something thomas um, but one of the questions is how often should we check uh, for these uh, uh, pharmaceuticals in water uh, water supplies and samples one question that's uh, in my mind related to that is you know if we think about our murray darling system we have multiple wastewater treatment systems disposing water upstream of a village or a town where they then take the drinking water. In it. And we know that standard water treatment process typically does not attenuate or remove the pharmaceutical products. And, and it, it probably accumulates, I would estimate, as you go downstream. So what should we do? Should we be adding the testing of these chemicals to our water supplies and also in testing of our field samples? What's the sort of frequency you, you, you think we should do and should we do this sort of work? Do I start? If you have them. <laughs> if, either one. You can I can I can get a start, and I'm sure we yeah please do, uh, Adi, because again there's no one way of doing this, but based on what I know that I've been now part of designing the first kind of sampling design, I would say that let's start let's start at least doing see look at seasons differences between seasons will be my starting point, and use the passive samplers and spot sampling, and then based on those results then use that to narrow down, like, do we need to do it uh, that often? But also let's uh, visit the same sites multiple times because without, when you just do single study like we did, yes, we have, an, have a snapshot, but it, it's not gonna tell us about the average concentrations that are out there. But then again, there's, with this one, you can go, you can, yeah, the more you do, the better understanding you get. So there's almost no limit to this, but I know that there needs to be then, you need to draw the line somewhere. So I would say at least try it, yeah, 
every season and then tar do it in a targeted manner. But then when you do sample, sample well, sample different biota, water, and, and more than just a fish. But we didn't look at, any, you know, as I said, no, any, no spiders, no invertebrates, nothing. So there is definitely, when you do sample, then collect as many as you can. But Thomas, any other so ideas? No, I, I completely agree, especially, I mean, it's really important to, to sample biota because, to be honest, it's not really what's in the water that is important. It's what's in the organisms uh, because it has to go into them to have an effect. Um, and some compounds you can't measure in the water or you won't find in the water, but you will find it in, in, the, in the organisms because they... They bioconcentrate it, and it's below detection level in in the water, but it's high enough in in the fish, um, especially lipophilic uh, lipophilic compounds. Um, but if you have such a situation, I would I would sample the drinking water in that village because I, I bet you can find fifteen pharmaceuticals in the drinking water. Yeah, well, that um, people might be a bit concerned about actually doing the sampling for fear of finding something, I suspect. But just related to this, the two questions are, uh, is, is one is, will EPA be continuing the monitoring to develop a good time series? And in related to that, as a result of the monitoring that you've acquired, which showed that there was elevated levels upstream from the discharge point, they've also asked, how do you explain those results? Uh, first, so the first question was, will EPA continue this? Um, at the moment, we don't have, um, so that funding for that was given to, to do that one, um, one sampling, one, that sampling program that I presented. So yeah. in the near future, unfortunately, we don't have resources for that. But, um, but hopefully then when we, yeah, when we publish this and then in the near future, there will be then um, more support for this kind of work. But at the moment, no, this was a bit of a one-off study. Uh, with, without uh, follow-up follow -up work. But however, we are working, we're um, analyzing recycled water. So we have a project on looking at recycled water and that started, is funded by DELP. Mm. And that's uh, work that the sampling has been done for that. And we've been actually um, um, analyzing infant and effluent waters. So this time we didn't look at environmental samples. We went uh, back to the, almost to the source, looking at infant and effluent, what comes in, what is treated. And we were analyzing those samples uh, for pharmaceuticals and personal care products and ADCs and, and for PFAS. And we sampled 30 different STPs uh, across Victoria and the sampling was done uh, between April and, and June this year. So that is a work that still that will report that uh, in the next 12 months. I, I, I thought all water was recycled, but that, I'm just being a bit obtuse <laughs> there. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> which it is true. So the, another question is um, quite an important question about dissemination of knowledge. What types of publications or educational materials are available to be distributed to pharmaceutical waste uh, generators or better still to inform them of the long-term environmental risks associated with waste residues, waste residues being discarded down unfiltered drainage? No, very good point. And yes, I would say probably quite limited still in quite an emerging area. Uh, from the regulatory point of view, and my understanding is when you look at different states as well, the Victoria is leading, leading the pharmaceutical work at the moment. So there is probably, when you look at the website, there's quite limited. So we'll definitely, that is a, something that we can do and we'll be doing that providing more information on the website. But, um, but then hopefully, Thomas, I'm sure some of your articles will be on our open access. So actually uh, public can access the scientific research uh, to some extent, so the information is there, but it doesn't mean that it's always understand in a format, in a lay language that is easy for anyone to read, but there is um, information, but yeah, there's definitely room for improvement in terms of giving guidance on um, how to, what can different duty holders do? T Thomas, what did they do in Sweden about this problem? Uh, thankfully, uh, they are, <laughs> it started to move. Um, <clears throat> the EPA in Sweden has, uh, devoted uh, 250 million per year um, starting three years ago for five years, consecutive years uh, for improving uh, uh, or implementing uh, pharmaceutical uh, removal techniques in the wastewater treatment plants in Sweden. 
so we still have one more year to, I'm a part of the valuation group of those uh, applications that wastewater treatment plants can apply for money from the EPA, 90% of the cost of the technique implementation. And then um, depending on how much uh, environmental benefit it will give, we, we evaluate the, the applications. But um, so that's a great step forward, uh, at least that we, we are sort of uh, trying to uh, find the worst spots and, and remedy those. Um, um, apart from that, um, we have a, a center for pharmaceuticals in the environment um, that were um, started in two years ago in Uppsala. It's the um, Swedish medical agency that uh, runs it. And it coordinates uh, all Swedish researchers and um, decision makers and uh, the industry and tries to um, yeah, be a sort of a spider in the net, uh, finding and increasing the, the information flow and the, the collaboration between the different uh, groups. Um, uh, also regulators are an important part there. Um, but uh, apart from that, uh, I think um, it's, we're, we're starting to implement it on a, uh, a county level as well, the, the pharmaceutical sampling in different, um, like a monitoring uh, thing in, in different streams. Um, so, that, so the awareness have increased enormously the last 10 years. I would say from nothing to, to what it is today. And it's, uh, it's really, um, I'm really happy about it. Yeah, that's it's fantastic. It seems, uh, as with PFAS as well, the, uh, the Nordic countries are a bit ahead of the curve here. So in relation to uh, understanding the toxicological effects, uh, uh, Paul is asked a question. He said, where we can't measure the effects using traditional endpoints, such as limb damage, what about using other uh, molecular biological techniques, such as metabolomics, for example? Or yeah. DNA, meth DNA methylation, and you know oh. those sorts of modern techniques. Are you involved in that, or do you have colleagues? Yeah. I, I, I am involved in that a little bit. I am co-supervising a PhD student that is uh, together with the chemist at uh, at Umeå University, and she's uh, doing metabolomics, um, looking at how wastewater exposure affects metabolomic. Um, profile uh, in, uh, she's using uh, damsel fly larvae, so an invertebrate as, as uh, her study organism. Um, she's published two papers so far about in this topic and has a couple of more coming, but um, metabolomics are tricky because it's, yeah, you see that things happen, but you, it's really hard to know what, especially when you're looking at an insect where many of these pathways are, yes, no one knows. Um, so it's it's not, you can't sort of translate the pathways that uh, they represent in humans to what, what they do in, in insects. Um, so so it's, it's a definitely an exciting and interesting tool. Uh, I encourage everyone to try and figure it out because that would help a lot. Uh, and and um, I'm excited about uh, pursuing this as well, um, especially trying to identify pathways that might represent behavioral effects and uh, other um, uh, effects that are really hard to see in in um, in the field or in in the lab as well. Um, uh, Thomas Minna, I think um, the questions are slowing, and I think we can draw this to a conclusion, I would like to say, unless you have anything else to say, do you have anything else you want to add today? No? I'll say thank you very much for your time, both of you pre preparing your slides and giving your afternoon out to tell us about this really important, fascinating research. It, it looks like we're really at the beginning of a long journey where we're beginning to understand the consequences of treatments 
that are being applied to people, which then filter into the environment. And it really does look like a Rachel Carson uh, moment in, in time. So I'd also like to thank everybody who's attended this live stream seminar today and for the excellent and interesting questions that have been submitted. We look forward to seeing everybody at our next Environmental Science Series event, which is in October 2021, the top of, topic of which will be microplastics. And Thomas, Minna, everybody else, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to you in Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>